This time on Watchers of Tomorrow, Reverse Irish Unification. Hello, welcome to Watchers of Tomorrow, the sci-fi review and critique show that uh, is very confused and culturally out of date because uh, I, I don't... I just don't know what to do with this one, with how much hmm. our cultural shift has happened on the last few years. <laughs> I blame nine eleven. Uh, yeah, that's that's basically the entire thing. <laughs> my name is Kevin. I'm joined as always by my friend and co-host Doctor Isix. Hi. And this week we have um, an episode called "The High Ground," which, um, very surprisingly. Both sides is terrorism. <laughs> In a way, I suppose. Uh, uh, it is, I, I guess, maybe not so cut and dry in terms of the, uh, you know, you know, both sidesing of it. But it is definitely, yeah, there's a lot of terrible people involved in these this conflict here. And, uh, yeah, they're all kind of dicks. <laughs> I don't, I don't think they do it super well. But they're very obviously trying to do a, like, we can see both sides of this sort of thing. But with a weird terrorist subplot that, I don't know, we're going to get into the history stuff. But, like, this can basically almost only be about Ireland at this point in history. Kind of. Uh, they do cite some historic examples, but we can sort of touch upon those later. Um, but, uh, you yeah, know, there is... Um yeah, there's a lot of uh, bits and pieces here that can kind of be applied to a lot of different conflicts, but in terms of uh, the uh, you know what's kind of being showcased here, it yeah it does kind of echo the troubles a bit. Mm. So this was written by Melinda M. Snodgrass, who we've talked about several times before, from Measure a Man, Pen Pals, Up the Long Ladder, and Sense of Command. Also, yes. a lot of 80s and 90s shows like L.A. Law and Outer Limits and etc., etc., etc. This is her last Star Trek credit for now. So. Yeah. Uh, I will also point out that uh, this is one of the uh, few Star Trek episodes uh, of this era that uh, had a, uh, a, a female uh, writer as well as director. Yeah. We didn't get a lot of female directors in this era. Interestingly, we don't focus on the directors because they do all the visual parts that's hard for us to talk about. Yeah, oh, because you know we're we're just using our voices here, but uh, you know uh, Gabriel Beaumont, uh, uh, you know you know did a lot of other things. Uh, did an episode of uh, Deep Space Nine, um, several episodes of TNG, uh, and you know and so on and so forth. So you know they're they're you know a veteranish Star Trek director. So you know. And we got a small group of guest stars this time. There's a lot of bit actors around but there's only like one representative person from each side of this two-sided conflict. So, uh, you know, people in the background, you know, milling about extras and a couple other folks that are just sort of there and kind of have lines. So we have Kerry Kane as Alexandra Devo. She's a Canadian actor who started in Canadian horror films, uh, The Incubus and Spasms. So I haven't seen Incubus as a horror film thing. That's kind of an interesting one. Hmm. That's Laura Kincaid. <laughs> it doesn't really subvert your sexual predator archetype, but it really it's it, it's one that you don't see very often, considering how unsubversive of a sexual predator archetype it is. <laughs> uh, I can't say I've seen that myself. So <laughs> Me either it sounds bad. Uh, she's also shown up in various '80s and '90s stuff. Uh, Including things like Kung Fu, the movie. Yeah, um, uh, something called Shock Trauma. <laughs> Distant Thunder. Uh, Flight 90, Disaster on the Potomac. Alien Nation, The Enemy Within. Yeah, that's all the ones I wrote down. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, it was also in uh, Beverly Hills 90210 for a while. Uh, it's two different characters. Yeah, fun. Never saw any of that ever. Uh, I had older sisters. They watched it sometimes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, blame it on the sisters. <laughs> well, I avoided it like a plague because like, wow, this is so boring. <laughs> See, I'm an only child. I am not allowed to, to blame my gender discretion on siblings. <laughs> <laughs> we also have Richard Cox as Carl Finn. 
Uh, started on Broadway in the 80s. Many small roles in TV and films, including a run on a show called Executive Suite, which is a soap opera based on company board members, which sounds like the most boring soap <laughs> opera premise ever. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I think I'll pass on that. Uh, Given soap operas, they could all be vampires. I don't know, <laughs> but just on the face of it. <laughs> yeah, there's been in a lot of other things, too, though. Was also in a lot of shows, like, you know, Magnum P.I., something called The Bronx Zoo, which I was very disappointing to learn, uh, was is about a high school and not a, the Bronx Zoo, which is one of the larger zoos in the area and is kind of cool. <laughs> Uh, was also uh, apparently regular in uh, Loving. Loving, okay. Yes. <laughs> also was in Freddy's Nightmare, which we've mentioned more times than I thought I would in the last few episodes because it's something I had never heard of before. And now it seems like there's a guest star from it in every episode. Well, it's kind of uh, contemporary to this era here, and uh, you know a lot of random people are in it. And, yeah, you know. on one of those uh, <laughs> anthology shows, they need new characters every week because, I, as I assume, they all die. Yes. <laughs> uh, he also played uh, Prospero in The Librarians. Yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, this is jerk-ass Prospero where it's like, yeah, I want to like take over the world here and, and do evil with magic as opposed to, you know, give up my books. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> I need to find that show. Seems like a natural. Seems like something I'd like, given how big a fan of Warehouse Thirteen I was. It has a similar vibe, I'd say. Uh, you know, a, a, you know, a little bit more uh, tongue in cheek. But yes, <laughs> this is uh, this. That, that's it. That's all our guest stars. What about uh, the, the 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 random terrorist number fifty three or a wounded person or Bailey? <laughs> all right, we can have uh, Christopher Patil as. Boy. Boy. Yes. Oh, Credited boy. as boy. Yes. It's the only thing he's been in. <laughs> Best known for his role as Jesse James in the Western TV series The Young Writers. Hmm. Chicago Hope. And as Zach in the cult comedy film Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter is Dead. Oh, yeah. That was a weird movie. It was filmed, which released a year after this, which means it must have been in production at the same time as this, because you cannot make a movie in a year. I don't even care. I don't care if it's a horror movie. Uh, but yeah, uh, he, he played uh, several Zacks, um, and uh, so that must mean he's a Lego maniac. <laughs> I think this is because it was the 90s. <laughs> Wait a minute. How old was this kid? Born in 1976. So, four, 14. He doesn't look 14 in this. Anyway. You know, yeah, 14 is that awkward age where some of the uh, your peers are like, st still look like they're 10 and other ones look like they're 18. And it's kind of weird. <laughs> mm, yeah. Anyway. Boy. Boy! It's made famous by uh, yeah, God of War. <laughs> so, the Enterprise is at the planet Rutia 4 to provide uh, medical supplies and general humanitarian aid because the planet has been having a string of violent protests from a separatist faction. Hmm. That's all we know That's... about them. They are separatists. From what, yeah. we don't know. To what, we don't know. Yeah, so uh, yeah, are they uh, separatizing because they just want to you know, home rule? Uh, do they? Is there some sort of ongoing oppression of their society or culture? Uh, you know, is there something else going on here? Is there... You know, maybe uh, this is the part of the planet where they dump all the radioactive yeah. waste. To which I'll, I'll give you a bit of a spoiler. The, the show answers all of these questions with a big, hearty shrug. <laughs> all right. So we don't know why they're really fighting. They just want to be independent. Okay. Yeah. They're just there. The planet's not part of the Federation. So, you know, they can't do a lot else. But they've been trading allies. So they're here to help with this unpleasantness. Troubles, you might call them. Yes. Troubles. Oh, Crusher, Data, and Worf are hanging out in a cafe when a bomb goes off. Crusher runs for help despite both Worf and Data going, this is not safe. Uh, Picard does, well, um, you you can try to stop her. Good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, there's a, a certain pecking order here, and uh, when people are hurt, you don't stand in the way of Crusher. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. 
Uh, one of the waiters from the cafe seems a little bit too interested in Crusher and her doctoring. Then a man suddenly appears out of thin air, grabs Crusher, and disappears into equally thin air. Oh no, it's a wizard! Yeah, wizard did it. <laughs> the crew is confused, um, but this now brings the Federation into a conflict, which would seem to be a very bad plan by the terrorists. Yeah, the the Federation has uh, you know power and influence and lots of spaceships and you know phasers and multispectral uh, everything's. Mm -hmm. What are you gonna do? Carcer is now in a cave and meets Finn, who's the leader of the terrorists. He wants to be friends, uh, but for now she just refuses to talk. She just sits there and stares. It's kind of, it's it's good. It's good characterization. It makes for a very boring scene to talk about and describe. <laughs> It's like, well, you're, you're being silent. Uh, I'm going to talk at you for a while. and uh, Yeah, he monologues right, for a bit. Hmm. They did get someone who's pretty good at monologuing for the terrorist leader, which is, you know, good. Good good job. Yeah, he's a wizard, and he's good at monologuing. Uh, Wesley is uh, understandably concerned that his mother was captured by terrorists. Uh, Picard has him work on a way to track their movements so that he has something to keep him busy while uh, they go talk to the cops. Yes, oh, wait a moment. Don't talk to the cops. Riker goes to talk with Alexandria, who is the head cop, in a uniform that is very Judge Dread adjacent. Yes. <laughs> uh, actually, this, uh, uh, this very same uniform will be used uh, later in uh, Voyager on a different planet uh, with a different, uh, you know, criminal activity thing going on yeah let's just uh keep it in storage dig it out every time we need the uh you know fascist heel of oppression yes you know uh, though, though the i will say that the uh the policing here is terrible as it is still less what the hell uh is the, the one in the voyager episode so so the cops here are in the process of brutal crackdowns because they're fighting terrorism and uh you know, she has a whole backstory of I used to be liberal and middle of the road and, and all the the good kind of the good one. And then the terrorists took out a bus full of kids and, and that was it for me. And now I'm full fascist because that's the only way to deal with people who will take out a bus full of kids is to start arresting kids. Did you tell them that uh, they should only care about you being uh, nicer than the previous person and not any of the other problems that we're not talking about? Yeah, basically. <laughs> it's like my 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 previous guy would shoot them and I just beat them a bit. So, you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there's no one disappearing under my watch. You know, they they're, they're going to go back home and tell people how all terrible they were treated. So she starts mass arrests, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. She also goes, "You know, too bad we don't have some of your cool federation weapons we could use to kill the terrorists, huh? Huh? Hint, hint, hint." Yeah. Oh, yeah, but, but you already have guns. Uh, you don't need more phasers. <laughs> Yeah, they never really explain what the Federation weapons have over everybody else's guns. Because once you have something that can, like, you know, vaporize someone at 50 feet, it seems like you've kind of reached peak gun. Yes. <laughs> Maybe it has some sort of mind-reading power so you never miss or something? I don't know. <laughs> oh, Finn finally gets Crusher to eat something and uh, explains that she is here because he needs a doctor. He wants her to help his people because the Federation is, you know, helping the other guys. So, seems fair. Yeah, there is maybe some reasonableness to this. You know, like, yeah, if they're going to be giving medical supplies to one side, you know, maybe they should be giving them to both sides here. You know? Yeah. Crusher points out that all they're doing is helping the ones who are hurt. He goes, yeah, I know they were hurt. I hurt them on purpose. You're kind of undermining my whole thing. Yeah, I, I want them to suffer for a while longer, and, you know, you're kind of undoing that, so stop it. So Ven takes Crusher to the people he wants her to help. Um, she needs a better environment, wants to contact her ship, get stuff, and goes, Oh, you think the ship would help if you contacted them? Oh, well, too bad that I already anticipated your needs and have boxes of random supplies and stuff. Oh, uh, like the, some of the supplies that we've been delivering here anyway. Yeah. So we are kind of helping both sides. Yeah. Also, oh. <laughs> here's a child to underscore how terrible and bad the situation is. All right. Well, um, you know, uh, p holding up a kid to say that you know, you're justifying your violence uh, because of this kid, um, that's more exploitation of the kid as opposed to explaining why you're 
you know, your, your whole campaign is reasonable here. So, so Riker, uh, spending more time with Alexandria is surprised at how many people she's arresting because they're rounding up lots and lots of random people. She says there's probably only about 200 or so people in the terrorist organization, but they've arrested 5,000 people who are sympathetic. Wow, that seems uh, ridiculously, um, you know, uh, silly. (laughs) (laughs) You know, if the, the Federation's like, yeah, we like respect the rights of people, yeah, you should maybe like go, you know, this is, you know, the, these people who aren't being treated like people here or citizens, they are being treated as, you know, almost cattle here in terms of what you're doing with them here. You're just rounding them up because they looked like, you know, they look the, uh, the profile effectively. Yeah, it's kind of like if you have a mutually beneficial trade partnership, you're not going to look too closely at your internal governmental practices. Yeah, that seems like, um, um, bad thing in general i'd say but yeah let's let's keep going hmm. so crusher's got a little assistant who's the child that brought all the equipment she's trying to make friends oh, yeah. um this actor's not paid enough to talk so uh, it's yeah. not going well <laughs> yeah that's why he doesn't have to get a name mm-hmm. finn wants to know if she can save his people uh, but no they've got some sort of weird dna damage that she's never seen before and has no idea how to reverse mm. finn reveals that it's from their dimensional transporters Crusher goes, dimensional transporters, those things kill people. Yeah. We've all heard of this. We know this. Now, this seems like a terrible thing. However, if the genetic damage doesn't happen, like, you know, in the first five uh, uh, trips, it could be also a potent weapon if you want to, like, use it sparingly and had more than 200 people to make use of it. Yeah, maybe some of those, you know, 5,000 people who are being radicalized by, you know, being arrested. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Maybe you should be uh, focusing on recruiting as opposed to just indiscriminate killing here. Especially if you have a thing that, say, you could have a guy use two times to, like, go into and then out of a prison with a bunch of people who were arrested. Yeah, you could, you know, liberate everybody and uh, bring them right into your secret base here and everything would be cool. Also, the interesting thing here is these, these like, dimensional transporters are, like, the next level of transporter technology, right? They can do all kinds of amazing shit, work way better. The only problem, as they say, is no organic material can survive it. My main question is, why are they not using these for uh, material transport then? Yes. <laughs> it's like, oh, uh, we want to, uh, you know, move massive amounts of uh, materials between here and there. And, uh, well, uh, because we're under planetary blockade, we uh, have to keep our shields up. Well, we can just use this, and there you go. Yeah, seems like or, you could uh, you easily use this to send supplies, as long as it's non-organic supplies. Or if you're, uh, you know, actively combating somebody, he's like, well, we're just going to uh, send our photon torpedoes through their shields with this technology by, uh, you know, basically popping it in there and letting it go off. Yeah, seems like there's all kinds of uses for this thing that we've never heard of before and we'll never hear of again. Because it's too dangerous for people. So meanwhile, Data, Jordy, and Wesley are coming to exactly the same conclusion that the molecular vibrations they've detected means that the terrorists are using bad transporters. Yes, the, the naughty transporters. Yeah, Wesley goes, wait, this is something I learned about in physics, this folded space transport. And Data goes, wait a minute, that kills people. <laughs> Why would anyone willingly do that? And then they just go like, these people aren't rational. Uh, or they're desperate. Uh, but yeah. anyway, uh, is- I, I do actually like this scene uh, because it's not Wesley just having all the answers, but it's like, you know, we're going to kind of talk things out and I'm going to make use of my super genius and, you know, half remembering things from classes I took, fo- f- you know, 15 minutes ago or something like that. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm going to be all like, hey, we're going to we're going to you know come to solution and uh, you guys have a lot more experience here. And we're going to put this thing together and make good use of our, all our uh, strengths. Yeah, they do seem to have finally figured out how to write him as a genius kid who's not magic. Too bad it's like the last season they utilize him in any kind of realistic way. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, good job, season three uh, writers. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we figured out how to use Wesley just in time to write him out of the show. Oh, Riker talks to Alexandria about how she's doing a fascism. Um, mm-hmm. She goes, that bomb was set by a teenager. How can I respond to such a crazy world other than to do evil cop shit? 
Well, you could, I don't know, uh, maybe try to solve the fundamental problems here that are, uh, you know, encouraging the separatism. But, you know, you never talk about that. You just want to round up people and put them in jail. Yeah, they don't do a great job. You can kind of tell that they're like, oh, both sides are using extreme measures, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but one side is fascist cops. So either you're not doing a very good job endearing us to your one <laughs> side here. <laughs> Yes, it's like, oh yeah, these other guys, you know, get, get, you know, do some uh, kind of terrible and uh, not very actually useful tactics here, uh, while the other side are fascist cops. So, uh, yeah, it's time to make a choice, guys. Uh, Crusher sees Finn drawing and goes, "Oh, you should have been an artist instead of a terrorist." And he goes, "I'm multi-talented. I can do both things." Uh, well, good enough. <laughs> He also studied a weird amount of Earth history because it is the only history that matters. Well, uh, maybe he heard, heard that there's a lot of separatist movements on Earth back in the day, so it was like the thing to do while every other planet is a planet of hats, so they don't really do that. Yeah. <laughs> he goes, I'm just like your Washington. He was an independence fighter. And Crusher goes, yeah, I don't know enough about history to debunk that, even though that would be pretty easy, but sure. It's like, yeah, there was this whole Continental Congress, and uh, you know, he was like appointed by the, uh, the representatives of the various states here. Wasn't just a guy who self-appointed himself a leader and decided to go kill people. Yeah, you could have maybe gone with the French Revolution if you wanted to hear, um thing. Or maybe, you know, there's something Irishy. Yeah, yeah, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, even though this episode uh, ends up getting banned in the UK for, like, years on end, uh, we can't talk about that directly because, you know... You know, we're going to mention it briefly and hope no one notices. Which they did notice, so, you know... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Alexandria is like, I'm trying to help you, Riker. Why don't you want me to torture people for information? Uh, because it's not working and not helping and terrible. So, yeah, they've captured the waiter dude from before. And Riker just goes like, tell your people we're willing to listen to their demands off with you now. So, you know, uh, go and actually do something useful in all the situation person who, you know, isn't a cop. So Data and Wesley are close to figuring out the dimensional transporter. Uh, but they need them to make some other amount of jumps for them to be able to trace it. Oh, it's a, it's like a spore drive situation. Got it. Data has some questions about terrorism because uh, it seems to work out sometimes. Like, you know, the Irish reunification, which everyone remembers and is memeing the hell out of. Yeah, in, uh, in uh, 2024. Wait, wait a moment. Captain, that's happening right now. Yeah. It, maybe. <laughs> They do seem to be doing something interesting with their whole uh, EU situation. Yeah, they, uh, there's also you know some you know you know technically the uh, you know the Tory government there, conservatives as uh, you know have uh, violated some of the important agreements that you know kind of brought the uh, troubles to a conclusion for a while. So who knows where things are going to go? Yeah. So data goes. Well, maybe looking at the history, terrorism and general violent action are an acceptable thing to do when all options for peaceful resolution have been tried and failed. Picard goes, that's a question humans have struggled with for years. Yeah, technically. I um, love his, I love the writer's <laughs> non-committal non-answer. It's, they're just standard. Where they're mm -hmm. like, here's a very logical way to think about this controversial topic, is people have never been able to come up with an answer for that. There, there is, uh, conflicts are messy, and there are multiple ways you can sort of approach them. And uh, this is maybe the, the least useful of shrug. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, Mr. Waiter is reporting back to Finn because, oh, my God, he is a terrorist or sympathizer or something. He knew a guy. Yeah. And all he knows is Riker's working with the cops. So uh, what about that whole, uh, you know, we want to negotiate now? Nope. Then decides that the best uh, response to them working with the cops is to destroy the Enterprise because that'll finally make someone listen to him. Well, oh, um, okay. Um, so about that Riker wanted to listen to you thing before. Uh, we're just, just going to, okay. So several terrorists get onto the ship with their transporter things. They shoot a few random dudes and plant a bomb on the warp core. Geordi's able to remove it uh, and uses his comm badge to have them beam it into space just before it explodes. I also love the, like, he goes, walk onto my position and beam it into space. And Troy hears and goes, his position? It's like, they, you've done this before. Yeah. <laughs> you know how this <laughs> works. 
<laughs> yeah, well, maybe that's why we set up like special transporter codes later. Uh, so, you know, you know what, what you're doing and why. Yeah. Without having to be all shocked. <laughs> like activate bomb into space protocol. Thank- yeah. <laughs> Then terrorists warp onto the bridge. Uh, they shoot out Worf's leg. Then the guy's cold cocked by Picard, which is kind of fun. Picard doesn't usually get to hit people. Yes. <laughs> then they grab Picard and leave. Hmm. Well, I, I guess maybe that hitting him like wasn't a good idea. Okay. So Alexandria uses this as a chance to try to recruit Riker. Going, see, 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 they're crazy. They're crazy. Don't you want to help me kill them all? Um. No. Uh, Wesley says that they just need the terrorists to do one more jump, and they'll be able to track them back to the base. Well, uh, you know, maybe they'll make start making some demands now that they have a, a higher value, uh, you know, hostage to you know make use of. The guard finally gets to talk to Crusher, and uh, she tries to convince him that uh, you know Finn's not actually as bad as all that. The guard goes, "Oh my God, uh, you've been Stockholmed. I don't have to listen to you." Yeah, you, don't you remember your training from the, you know, in back in the academy when they told that you might be in situations like this because we're, you know, that's what Star Trek's about. Yep. Weird situations. <laughs> Seems pretty like it's pretty um uncharacteristic. They really really want to have some I don't even know what they're going for with that. Like the person who's actually heard their plans is minorly sympathetic and cuz oh my god, you're listening to the enemy. <laughs> Uh, yeah, maybe uh, there should be a longer conversation here to maybe lay out some more details on things, but we're not going to get that, so, you know. Finn shows up. Picard gives him the, you've kicked the hornet's nest speech. Uh, Finn goes, well, uh, you see, if I kill a Federation captain, the Federation will have to get involved, but they don't want, want to, you know, kill us all because they're the Federation, and they won't want to stay here for very long, so they're going to force a political negotiation and uh, that will turn out better for me, regardless of what happens. So maybe I actually have thought this through. He's got a point, Picard. Uh, the Federation at this point is, uh, you know, a little shy on the uh, the whole open conflicts thing, like to kind of a weird degree. And uh, that's going to cause problems for you later, by the way. And uh, <clears throat> Maki, uh, and uh, yeah, so uh, maybe this is a a big red flag that maybe the Federation should have. I guess a different sort of perspective on how to deal with this sort of situation, because this guy is going to be playing them like crazy here. Yeah. Well, the Maquis thing is actually more in line with what they're doing this whole episode of, uh, we see nothing wrong with working with the fascists for some reason. Mm -hmm. And, uh, we're going to ignore anyone who tells us that that's a bad idea. Cause you know, uh, we want to work with the people here that, uh, say they're in charge and have a bunch of guns. That's how, how working with people works, right? Yeah. Sven jumps back to the Enterprise with his warpy thingy uh, right in front of Troy. Goes, hey, you've got 12 hours to enforce a trade embargo on the planet or Picard's dead. Well, um, you're talking to Troy here, and so she knows that you're probably serious. Uh, on the other hand, uh, she's maybe, weirdly enough, not a good negotiator when, you know, <laughs> there's, uh, you know, she doesn't necessarily have a lot of authority. Yeah, I guess when you're jumping randomly to a ship and that's going to make you, like, you know, almost die, you kind of just have to tell whoever's closest. So mm. it's lucky he wound up near a main character. I mean, what if he just jumped in, saw some random ensign, it's like, tell the captain this thing. It's like, I don't, I don't even know who that is. I can't. <laughs> I'm not allowed on the bridge. <laughs> I just got here. <laughs> now, remember, Wesley was one jump away from being able to track their location. Mm-hmm. So now... They know where their secret cave is, and they have a plan to turn off the lights in their secret cave. Excellent. And then they won't be able to see, and thus they will not be able to find the bathroom. And thus, the uh, uh, um, yep, anyway. (laughs) So they take Alexandria and uh, beam down with their attack team. Finn warns Crusher that he might have to kill Picard anyway. You know, just, just FYI. Um... But also, I don't want to do this. Here, have some drawings. Uh, thing. Uh, Picard tries to plan an escape. Crusher does the whole, we're going to die. I need to tell you some things because the writers still haven't figured out what's going on between us. Then the lights go out. I'm going to confess my, uh, never mind. <laughs> yeah. I need to confess. Oh, it's dark now. Sort of. Not really, but just my slightly dimmer. Um, mm-hmm. And that does confuse everyone. I know it's just 100. for like 
stage lighting purposes so we can see what's going on but they the because the lighting on this show is always a little odd this <laughs> this doesn't really look that different they aren't yeah, doing I mean, a whole like yeah we're just showing you we're like you know showing you what's going on it just looks like everything dimmed out very slightly and then everyone started going crazy because it dimmed out because they're able to see fine without like flashlights or equipment or anything so obviously it's not that dark <laughs> Yeah, it would be, I guess, maybe a, a more interesting uh, way to set things up if everyone just pulls out their flashlights, and so the you know you know one side and the other side don't necessarily know who is who for a little while, and uh, and so you can and so the uh, the the SWAT team uh, folks can kind of like infiltrate uh, you know pretty quickly in, into the midst of everybody and then enact their action plan. Instead, no one even needs lights. So yeah. yes. <laughs> so Fen threatens Picard at gunpoint. Alexana shoots him in the back and yeah, kills him. She goes, "Ah, we couldn't let Finn be alive. As people would kill so many people trying to get him out of prison. This is the only way." Uh, do, do you remember that whole uh, weird teleporter thing they got? Yeah. You know, if they uh, have, they wouldn't if they have, have to kill very many yeah. people. Yeah. Yeah. They just teleport him out. Actually, then the boy <laughs> holds them at gunpoint, and the cops are ready to shoot the child because, you know, that's what the world's come to. Then Crusher tells him to put the gun down, and he does, and he just gets arrested instead of being shot. Yes, well, uh, at least he's not being shot, so. And like Xana goes, oh, it's a mini-terrorist. And Riker goes, no, it's a boy who was willing to put down the gun. Maybe that's the start to healing everything. Well, maybe, uh, hopefully. uh, Some sort of message. Now, there's a lot of work to do here, uh, like figuring out what the heck they actually are really trying to separate for. <laughs> but uh, yeah, this is uh, so. Uh, yeah, that, that kind of concludes things, I suppose. Yeah, Wesley is overjoyed that his mom's been safe, and then Picard goes, "Oh, hugging on the bridge." <laughs> well, it's maybe a good exception, I guess. So, yeah, that's um, our our moral is if you're willing if you're willing to put the gun down and just be arrested maybe things have a chance of working out uh i'm also going back to that uh, sort of awkward conversation uh, between uh you know uh, crusher and uh, picard in the cave uh, maybe picard should have like pointed out it's like yeah you know this guy that you're kind of listening to he almost blew up the ship and killed your son so maybe uh maybe don't trust him so easily yeah I know. He almost killed everyone you know is a pretty is a better argument than oh, you've been Stockholmed. Yeah. Hmm. So yeah, there's maybe a few weird issues with this one, but there is I guess they're they're also trying to I guess showcase a, a an endless uh, pointless conflict where everyone's doing terrible things and there is no heroes. And uh, I will at least give them credit for attempting something like that. Yeah, they don't um, do a great job. Because we have no clue what's going on most of the time. Yes. And uh, so I, I guess it's one of those things where uh, it unfortunately has too much plot. <laughs> this maybe would have worked out better as a two-parter where, uh, you know, uh, like the the, the the ending of the first one is, uh, you know, uh, you know, folks uh, going up to the Enterprise to plant their bomb and... Uh, that's how, uh, yeah, and then Finn looks over to uh, Crush right before he leaves and says, so uh, we're going to blow up the ship. See you later. Or something like that. Mm. <laughs> and then, dun, 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 dun. I think that one of the weird ones is um, they're, they're really trying to do a, like, do the ends justify the means thing because they're both using extreme things. They're doing an mm-hmm. extreme police lockdown on one side, and they're doing random terrorist bombings on the other side. But we we don't have even the slightest hint of what the ends are. Mm-hmm. Like they want to separate. Why they want to separate? Because this is an obviously quasi police state, or they want to separate because they want racial purity. <laughs> like what? Yeah, what are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> there is a lot of different reasons that uh, you know uh, some folks might be trying to uh, separate off from a uh, you know a, a government here, and some of them you know are reasonable, others are ridiculous. And if we don't know any of the why here, it's kind of up to us to imagine the options here, given the bits and pieces of maybe intentional hints, maybe not 
that we are uh, presented with here. And uh, yeah, it's just going to be kind of a mess in terms of how people uh, end up taking it at the end because there's not enough of that grounding. So really with our, you know, having to look at this now and we're going to talk about our historical versus modern sensibilities when it comes to this sort of thing, which really, really changes how to look at this episode. Um, but the the only piece of information we're given but of like what's going on with this conflict is that one side is cops and cops as we understand them now and since we're given no way to to think that the cops on this planet are any different from the way we're supposed to understand cops you know now in our own modern world um, cops are never on the progressive side of things ever for any reason so if the cops are against it it's probably because it's the better thing to be doing and so you, you get, you know, the, the cops, police in general, uh, are instilled into a society as a, you know, institution in order to enforce some sort of rule. And what that is on, you know, the ideal side is, yeah, you know, we're going to be uh, going after only people that are, uh, you know, actual criminals and things like that. In practice, that's generally not the case. Um, and, you know, when you get to worse and worse governments, you get situations where, you know, the crime is looking at them funny and that's it. Or not being of the right race or, uh, you know, uh, having the wrong religion or anything else. Wearing a funny hat that, you know, is forbidden. So you must now be uh, beaten to, uh, to death here. So, uh, yeah. Well, you have to get into the what they're there for originally, which is to protect rich people's property. Bingo. Just overall. Like, there's, there's an interesting th way to look at this that I've always found helps explain things very well, which is uh, the reason that people don't like cops and do like firefighters is because a cop will kill a person to keep them from, you know, to protect them from having, like, you know, painted on a wall or something. Mm -hmm. Like, they will fully disregard human life in order to protect a piece of property a firefighter will destroy as much property as necessary to save the person yeah so uh yeah there's definitely a divergence of priorities and uh, one of them is obviously much better <laughs> but the main thing that we have to address for this is um you have a terrorist faction being dealt with at least moderately empathically here. <laughs> like, you're, you're supposed to empathize with the terrorist dude. Whether or not you're supposed to agree with what he's doing or think that his motivations are just or justifiable, you're still supposed to treat him with a certain amount of pathos that you just do not get now. Mm -hmm. Because this is being written in the late 1980s came out in the very early 1990s um and from the research i was able to do the five years prior to 1990 there had been exactly two terrorist actions on u.s soil one of which resulted in absolutely no harm to anyone and was uh, arguably it's it's difficult to know whether it was actually an actual terrorist action or was just taken um you know, taken credit for as a uh, happenstance. <laughs> Sometimes uh, uh, groups and individuals take credit for things that they had no involvement in whatsoever because it looks good for their cause. Yeah, they, well, this, this this was just weird. There was like a a crop pest fly that was released in California and a group called the Breeders suddenly popped up and said like, ah, that was us. We did it to protest the kind of pesticide you're spraying into the air. And then they disappeared and were never heard from again. And they'd never been heard from before either. So it's like, well, um, that was a thing that happened apparently. Mm -hmm. The other thing was apparently there was a firebombing by some Islamic related person that I couldn't find a ton of information about, but there was only like one even like arguably terrorist action on u.s soil for five years before this episode so it's pretty understandable to be able to get into that kind of mindset that we had prior to 9 11 when this is a thing that happened to other people mm -hmm. and looking at it from that lens the only major thing that was going on at the time that anybody was talking about anyway there was some stuff going on in uh, the Middle East and the 
uh, Palestine-Israeli conflict was still, you know, going on at the time, but, but in a way we were ignoring then. But the main thing that was happening were the Troubles, which is the most fucking British way to talk about a basically Irish civil war. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, the Troubles. It, it's not, you know, a war. It's not a conflict. It's not a civil war. It's, it's, not, it's not, you know, you know people uh, getting uh, into uh, mass violence here in order to uh, enact change. Uh, no, it's simply the Troubles. It's like, uh, you know, someone getting... Uh, you know, a horrific disease and say, like, oh, yes, it is just the symptoms. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, yes, you, the uh, rash. <laughs> yes, uh, your arm fell off. Oh, that's just the rash. It's fine. <laughs> and this was still one of the most major things going on in international politics at the time, as we alluded to, even leading to this entire episode being banned in the UK for years because of uh, the one line about Irish reunification. I, I guess, you know, uh, you know, in the, uh, the post 9-11 uh, world of ours here, uh, you know, we uh, are uh, d- dealing with a uh, situation where uh, in terms of uh, attack rates, where like in the, uh, you know, dozens to, you know, maybe hundreds here of, uh, you know, attacks per year. And uh, during the, the troubles, you know, the, the hundreds there was the typical as opposed to the dozens. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's a, a definitely a, a scale difference here. And, you know, also the United Kingdom's much smaller than the U.S., so higher density. It was still the troubles and not the war, global war on terrorism extravaganza thing which we're doing now. Well, that was what, you know, kickstarted the whole thing. You have, obviously, 9-11 as a major historical event. And then that used as a catalyst for a lot of... Ex- Extremely right-wing swings in international politics, which led to a lot of invasions and wars and things that would take us an entire uh, multiple hours to cover fully. Yes. But basically, the history of the last, you know, 20-some-odd years. And uh, I, I guess uh, the uh, general uh, numbers of, uh, you know, you know uh, terrorism attacks of various sorts, uh, most of them, in terms of where they actually are, are mostly the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, it's not the UK. It's not the US. It's not, you know, uh, most of the other uh, countries in the Americas and things like that. You know, it is, you know, where, you know, the US policy has gone, has been about going in and, you know, beating people up and going to war and all that. That's kind of where these, you know, the, 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 the new troubles, you could say, <laughs> are, are, uh, uh, sort of uh, concentrated and you know there's also a bit of south asia as well and uh, sub-saharan africa but uh you know uh, if you take those uh, three general regions then everything else happening in the world is minor so something think, uh, perspective wise regardless of actual numbers actual attacks and the locations or frequency of these things the main thing that has shifted dramatically is just the way that we think about terrorism as a concept and as a person. Mm -hmm. Because we've gone from this representation, which is possibly misguided, possibly justified in certain situations. It is a question mankind has struggled to answer for all time to a terrorist is just a dehumanized, probably not white person who we can justify doing anything we want to for any reason because they're just an evil terrorist. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a definitely a perspective shift here. And, uh, I'll, uh, maybe it would be better served off by not ju- dehumanizing people and trying to figure out what the heck's actually going on and maybe trying to, solve the uh, underlying problems that are uh, sort of inciting all of this here which we're not gonna do so you know the interesting thing is you could you could write this episode like this episode particularly because it's so both sidesing with the cops and the terrorism as long as you took the word terrorism out of it and took the debate around terrorism out of it and called it direct action or violent reprisal or some other euphemism that we use when white people do it yeah (laughs) and you could write exactly this episode and people would be like oh this is so necessary for our times when we have all this stuff going on 
Yeah, yeah, this is uh, totally a, a group uh, uh, protesting injustice and uh, stolen elections. Yeah. <laughs> Which the only thing that's really changed is the way that we talk about the word itself, because that's just gotten mapped onto an already pre-existing colonialist idea that we have, especially regarding Middle Eastern countries. But kind of any non-white action will sort of slot onto that. Sorry, I'm getting a little distracted by some of the charts I have in front of me here. Uh, <laughs> uh, so it's like, oh yeah, you know, and uh, you know, there's, uh, you know, there's various uh, you know deaths, uh, you know, deaths from uh, by target. Um, you know, and uh, most of them t- tend to be military in focus and police. Uh, there's also uh, you know property and things like that. Uh, but if you're, uh, you know, the mention of the bus there is like you know, transportation is kind of a fairly minor one actually. Um, but yeah. The interesting thing is that there's an interesting thing to explore here, but they wanted to give so much care and attention to the terrorist side of stuff, which they didn't fully explore, and give us this non-ending neoliberal we can all get along if we meet in the middle shit, Mm -hmm. that they don't actually go into the part of it that's hinted at, which is, in a world where children are being killed by children, the only choice I have is to kill children. Yeah, that's a that's a terrible uh, conclusion. Uh, no matter how I, how you slice it here or come to it, because they're very mildly hinting at the response to the terrorism is as bad or worse than the thing itself, but they never yeah. really go enough into either side for it to do anything. <laughs> We, we, we find that Finn has a much better plan and has maybe actually thought through what he's doing in a way that the cops don't seem to have. That's about as far as we've gotten. He, he has plans. They might not necessarily be good plans, but they are going to cause action you know, and responses that uh, he wants. I mean, it's not a bad plan as far as plans go. It's got a lot of... Uh, probably unnecessary collateral damage Mm -hmm. but like that's not the part he cares about the thing he lays out is pretty is pretty logical and would probably work out he's uh definitely doing his best to maximize his leverage and uh you know influence of the uh you know over events here and uh you know in terms of that yeah it's a you know it's you know a perfectly reasonable plan um but yeah the the collateral damage point there uh, is you know maybe going to be piling up uh, against him in the long run in terms of uh, actually being uh, you know having you know useful negotiations and the like you know heck for all we know uh, you know if the enterprise was to be destroyed here and uh, you know the federation were to figure out oh there's these people that have this weird technology that's both killing them and you know can beam through our shields uh, maybe we should just ignore this planet entirely until all of them get themselves killed, <laughs> and then we'll come in and just mop up the mess. There's the other part of that that I didn't really... You know, they they have one line of, these aren't rational people to explain why they're willing to kill themselves for this. Oh, well, they are being kind of rational. Yeah, they're being just, quite no. rational. <laughs> just it, their, their, their assumptions are just different than yours. Well, <laughs> they're in an extreme situation. <laughs> where they're already putting their lives in danger, this really isn't that different. Like if they weren't using these transporter thingies that were killing them and giving them an advantage, they'd still be putting their lives in significant danger. Indeed. Well, you can still always get shot if you're uh, trying to do uh, some violence against people. Because, you know, that t- tends to prompt uh, hard responses. So overall, that's my thing with this. It's like, there's some very interesting stuff to look at in the way that our storytelling has changed around this as terrorism has become incredibly racialized and politicized in the United States. Um, you know, only the bad people do uh, a terrorism and, uh, you know, all the bad people uh, just happen to be of this uh, ideology and skin color. So, uh, you know, it's okay to hate those people that uh, have uh, similar traits. Yeah. And now we can't label certain things terrorism because, you know, it's done by white people. Mm-hmm. You know, even though they're trying to throw overthrow our government. Great. Hmm. So, uh, yeah, if it wasn't obvious, I, I'm going to, I'm happy to call the, uh, the, the attack on, uh, you know, the, uh, the U S uh, capital uh, on January 6th, an act of terrorism. So, you know, and it's definitely more so than releasing flies. Yes. <laughs> which was act- like labeled an act of bioterrorism, like. It hurt some food crops. I don't know if, like, it didn't seem like it hurt anyone particularly. 
Yeah, well, I, when I was an uh, undergrad, uh, you know, one of the uh, biology labs uh, uh, near where much of my classes were uh, was um, uh, broken into by some, uh, I think it was environmental or animal liberation front folks. And uh, they released a bunch of the, uh, you know, the lab animals, mostly rats and things like that. Uh, and, uh, you know, this was post 9-11. It was still being uh, described as terrorism because, you know, people are upset and it's, it, we, we're super hyper vigilant and we're still calling everything terrorism uh, that, you know, doesn't look like a normal crime here. Ah, <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of vandalism. It's always been my yeah. critique of uh, eco-terrorism. It's mostly vandalism. Yeah. And, uh, you know, some of it makes sense. Some of it's a little confusing, but I can get the messaging and other times I'm just confused. But, uh, you know, I generally am pro environmental, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, just protecting the environment and all that sort of stuff here. Um, so I, I guess I'm a little bit more sympathetic to uh, a lot of those sort of causes, uh, generally. Um, and you know, you know, I might disagree on some of the tactics, but, uh, yeah, I understand why people, uh, you know, get up to that sort of thing. So, yeah. Yeah. My, one of my childhood dogs that, that my mom had when I was growing up was named after the main character in the monkey wrench gang. So <laughs> maybe, maybe that's what, uh, you know, all of this, this, uh, you know, uh, conflict in this episode is about, uh, it's all about, uh, toxic waste being dumped into their, their water system here. Yeah. Well, we have no idea. We've got, yeah. you know, <laughs> we want to leave and we're going to make you stay with a police state. Hmm. Maybe we should uh, revisit this planet in some future Star Trek and uh, see how uh, terrible the things have gotten because they've decided not to solve their problems. Yeah, everyone's dead. Probably, I don't know, uh, brain attack. and Then we don't have to think about it anymore. Uh, I, I think an, uh, an internal uh, unraveling would be, would be a, a better way to go, but yeah, I'll probably end up in a brain Maybe attack, Pike so, gives them yeah. a speech about how January 6th happened and it makes everything better. <laughs> Well, uh, it, uh, you know, going to a more historical sort of, uh, stuff here, um, there is, uh, before the terrorism was the, uh, the, 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 the bingo term to ha- to be watching out for, for this sort of stuff. Uh, you know, there was plenty of, uh, you know, violence and things like that, uh, that's taken place. In fact, one of them was mentioned in the episode. Oh uh, yeah. Well, let's see. There was, oh, I forget all the things he mentioned on that. There was Ireland and... Something they made up and something else that was real. Yeah, the, the, the independence of Mexico. Oh, yeah, them. <laughs> yeah, uh, so uh, just a little bit of background here. Uh, some of the uh, early uprisings in, uh, you know, in you know, New Spain, uh, you know, it's like, yeah, we're, uh, we're, we're, we're having a, a, some, some mischief here and people are not happy with the elites here, but uh, it's the 1600s, so, uh, you know, we're, our little re- uh, uprising is going to be, uh, you know, crushed pretty easily because you know like oh you don't stand up against the king what are you doing here um and you know it's like oh yeah a bunch of folks are uh, having uh you know uh, being oppressed by uh you know the the spanish the spain uh uh, born spanish here and uh we don't like that because you know it would be nice to like have some sort of liberty this is still the 1600s so you know we're gonna crush that uh and so on and so forth uh but uh Roll forward to uh, the 1800s, uh, early 1800s specifically, and we got this, uh, the priest is like, hey, uh, you know, maybe we should be independent because there's a lot of stuff here that kind of sucks. Um, also, uh, over in Spain, Spain's kind of being invaded by Napoleon right now, so this might be our chance, guys. <laughs> <laughs> hint, hint, hint. Because, you, know, uh, you know, technically, you know, uh, Mexico, a.k.a. New Spain, is uh, being uh, put under control by a, 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 a junta, uh, you know, installed by the French here. And, uh, you know, maybe this is a, uh, some good folks to be rebelling against here because we can sort of be both nationalistic because, you know, the, the Spanish elites he- that are here don't like these guys and the rest of us, you know, might not like the Spanish elites, but we're going to be all like, yeah, we're, uh, we're, we don't like just the general situation we're in. So yeah, we're, we'll be about rebellion. And so this, uh, Hidalgo guy was like, I'm going to go about and, uh, you know, stir up some stuff, but eventually he does get killed. Then there was another priest that did something similar, um, <laughs> and you know, similar sort of uh, stuff happened with him in the end. Um, but uh, you know, there's still a, sort of a, a fair bit of uh, uprisings, and it took sort of years uh, for uh, you know the the Spanish to get a little bit of an upper hand. But then uh, over back in Spain, it's like, all right, um, we're going to have ourselves a little uh, overthrowing of the king here. 
because uh, you know we're not under French control anymore, but you know our king kind of sucks, so we're gonna you know do away with him. And so uh, folks in Spain, uh, you know, uh, New Spain, were like, yeah, all right. So we still have the same grievances, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, people that uh, you know are fully of Spanish descent uh, in uh, Mexico here, you know, still can't like be in charge of anything because they're not Spanish enough for some reason. Um, and everyone else is further down the, uh, de facto racial hierarchy and has crapper crapper jobs the further down you get. So this is terrible. And, uh, we're gonna, you know, use this opportunity to start fighting back against them. And, uh, then a weird thing kind of happened. Uh, uh, you know, some of the, uh, conservatives from uh, Spain were like, you know, maybe these independence folks have a good idea because we could actually just set up shop here and be independent of Spain with this whole idea of democracy or something like that, and just kind of rule independently in Mexico instead. All right, we're going to join you guys. Um, I know you hate us, but you know whatever. Um, and eventually, uh, you know, there was a uh, I'll, I'll, some a series of battles, and uh, the uh, you know the viceroy was uh, sort of encouraged to sign a peace treaty that uh, uh, declared independence for Mexico. Uh, the folks back in Spain didn't quite agree, but uh, he's like, all right. Uh, I, I'm, I'm giving up. I'm going to resign. Yeah, you're free. It's Treaty of Cordoba. It's good, you know. And so uh, uh, Mexico became into plan, uh, independent and be uh, quickly became an empire because remember those uh, elites and things like that who were like, we don't like this democracy stuff? Well, yeah. Anyway, um, not too long later, uh, the uh, locals are like, no, we're going to go ahead and uh, get rid of this empire thing and just become a, an actual like republic. So uh, bye. And that's how Mexico became a thing. <laughs> <laughs> truncated. So yeah, 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 truncated. Yeah, there's lots of back and forth. And, you know, this person invaded this city and uh, this, you know, there was a holdout of uh, Spanish troops in uh, like Veracruz or something like that. And, uh, you know, it's like only until, you know, this point that they uh, were actually able to, you know, push them out. Uh, you know, coalitions of different groups uh, fighting each other or fighting, uh, you know, the, 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 the people in charge and, you know, the different you know, groups kind of having shifting alliances. It was a real mess, but, uh, you know, eventually things kind of came together and, uh, you know, had a little empire for a little while and then that kind of uh, fell apart. So, you know, oh, and eventually sometime later, like the 1830s, Spain eventually recognized Mexico as independent. So yeah, there was a, there was indeed a lot of fighting and, uh, it was, uh, you know, a lot more complicated and messy than the U S revolutionary war. And it had a lot of cycles of trying to get off the ground. Um, cause, uh, you know, one of the main differences I suppose, uh, is that, uh, you know, chattel slavery was kind of the, you know, institutionalized, uh, you know, you know, thing going on in the U S and, you know, the, <laughs> the British were like, yeah, we're kind of starting to lean against that. And, uh, you know, also we're, uh, want you to be taxed and things like that. So it was very much more of the elites on the U S side, uh, plus everyone who was kind of tired of British rule coming together as opposed to the full, uh, you know, gamut of, uh, you know, all social classes, like it was in Mexico, you know, except the people at the top. So yeah, there's definitely a, a difference here in terms of, uh, you know, how, uh, you know, the two countries became independent. So, yeah. U.S. is very, the rich people want to be in charge, but, you know, different rich people. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's uh, a bit of, you know, you know, stuff there. And, uh, you know, I, I, I could try to uh, talk about every other country, uh, you know, south of Mexico, but uh, that will take you know, a while and more episodes of time. So, <laughs> yes. Uh, so don't worry. I, I'm not going to forget Argentina, you know, and... Uh, <laughs> And uh, you know the the whole Grand Colombia and Bolivar and things like that, and uh, you know the uh, unified Central America before it like broke up and things like that, and uh, that Panama was part of Colombia for a little while despite not really having any roads between the two. Anyway, <laughs> I think there's there's a big debate on how much violence and when to employ violence, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I do think one thing that is demonstrated well by this episode and then is not talked about in this episode is if the people who are doing violence are telling you that you're wrong for using violence something's wrong there yes <laughs> but uh you know uh so the you know it's like you don't use violence against me only use you know it's only acceptable to use violence against you 
Well, that's a terrible argument. I use violence, and when you respond violently, it just demonstrates how right I was to use violence. So, uh, yeah, people that make that argument are, are full of crap, just so you know. And that's the lesson <laughs> of the episode. <laughs> anyway, there was less to talk about with this episode than I imagined. Probably because it tries to be so milk toast with any of its points. Yeah, so... Uh, yeah, so in alternative universe, I'm going to go visit uh, Melissa Snodgrass there, and we're going to come up with a better episode. It's a two-parter. <laughs> it actually goes to the details about why they're tr- trying to declare independence, and uh, you know, people can make a more informed decision about uh, you know rightness or wrongness of various sides here. And you know, having that you know basis of why they're trying to declare independence be ambiguous still in terms of what you know uh, you know what side you want to uh, fall onto is still an option here. Just ignoring it completely is a little silly. Yeah. Also, while you're at it, ask what the hell is going on with her and the Irish? Hmm. Yeah. This and and up the long ladder. <laughs> yeah. Just what? Wh- why? <laughs> <laughs> Melissa, are, do do you have something you want to confess here? <laughs> How about you, Gepwin? Do you have something you want to confess? Oh, and I'm part Irish, like a something. I can never remember if it's like an eighth. I've got Irish and Scottish, and we're at war with each other. So you know. Um, I, I know at least one of my ancestors lived in Ireland for a little while. Um, more of them were for more, uh, you know, in terms of the, uh, uh, UK sort of, uh, general region there or England and its imperial empire. Um, you know, it's more Northern England, some Scotland, uh, um, other branches were like from Switzerland, Germany, Austria, Norway, that sort of thing there. So, so they had other conflicts to deal with. <laughs> Anyway, we've gone into a lot of depressing things again. I like yeah, like 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 yeah, you know the the uh, the one uh, group of folks uh, of my ancestors who uh, you know moved to the Americas and uh, they're like, yeah, we're gonna set up uh, a a Swiss colony uh, in uh, the Americas and it's gonna be great. And like most of us end up dying on the way over. Hooray! Wait, <laughs> yeah, uh, depressing. Yeah, like that. <laughs> it's probably time for us to move on. The galaxy's favorite game show. Woo! Hey everybody, welcome to the Galaxy's Favorite Game Show. Today we got uh, various uh, contestants here, and uh, some of them are teleporting around. It's getting a little hard to keep track of them, but they've been uh, racking up points all the same. So let's start handing them out. The first uh, prize is the Wonderful Hostage Prize, which goes to Crusher for doing, still doing her job, even though she's a hostage at the time. Uh, what does she win, Gepwin? She wins getting to smack Picard's stupid face, because... Not only does she not Stockholm, and that's a pretty shitty, but generally sexist thing to have written in for a dismissal. Mm-hmm. Um, there, there's research on how you don't, you know, cave to um, interrogation and pressure and things when you're in a hostage situation, and uh, paying attention to your like keeping your loved ones and family centered for yourself, and continuing to do your job, and basically all the stuff that she's doing kept her pretty mm-hmm. out of uh any of that not to mention that uh stockholm syndrome is probably fake to begin with but you know between all of that she should definitely have gotten to smack the card upside the head it's it's right there crusher uh, you just need to raise your hand and swing it over our uh, second prize is the uh, by any means necessary prize which goes to finn uh, and the separatists and you know, to lesser extent the cops uh because i guess they're not murdering people secretly anymore um, because uh, they really want uh, independence, uh, Finn and, and, their fo- and the folks there, and they don't really care who dies to get it. So uh, what do they win? They win an internationally recognized flag, because the difference between terrorists and freedom fighters is how many flags you can stick in things. Mm-hmm. And uh, I guess the the only exception is if it looks like a pirate flag at all, uh, people kind of disregard it, but everything else is good. So uh, get some good colors on there and people yeah, will love blocky it. blocky colors, maybe some weird legs. Mm-hmm. <laughs> going around in circles <laughs> our uh, final prize here is the end the cycle prize which goes to Picard and the uh, the teen there the the boy uh, who had the gun at the end because yeah because uh, maybe the you know best way forward is not not indiscriminate killing but you know it's still a weak ending so 
What do they win, Gapwin? The child wins. Stow away on the Enterprise and then maybe go join the Maquis, because uh, otherwise he's probably just going to get quietly disappeared. And, uh, you know, that, that's going to be terrible. And, uh, yeah, and uh, so Picard, uh, take the boy with you and uh, maybe some wacky hijinks can happen. That's all I got today, Gapwin. Uh, yeah. That's all this episode got to, actually. Uh, f- take us away, please. Yeah, thank you for joining us on this I Don't Know What We're Doing Here edition of the Galaxy's Favorite Game Show! Hmm. Well, let's uh, move on to uh, something uh, a-, a little bit more... Uh sensual yeah a little bit more naughty a little bit more uh, next time we get a one of those um alphabet letter episodes mm-hmm. and we're not talking about a or b or c it's gonna take you too long d. you oh, go the other oh, way oh, oh, oh okay <laughs> uh, i've lost count now <laughs> <laughs> so the next is uh one of the continued puns pun episodes this is Deja Q. Hmm. I wonder if it includes Q in some fashion. It might. I don't know. I'm not sure. Well, uh, some of these uh, you know, images I'm getting here uh, definitely uh, show uh, a laughing data and a, a, a moon that's going to fall. And, yeah. uh, and some nudes. Surrounded. And some nudity. And a uh, guy who was in psych later. <laughs> <laughs> And some aliens with like weird mouths yeah. uh, because they, they're cheap makeup, and they're like, "Yeah, we don't want them to look different here." So yeah, <laughs> Guinan gets to stab somebody. Yeah, Guinan, the most uh, effective battler on the Enterprise. Uh, and yeah, yeah, we do get to see what the alien makeup looks like when they get to really phone it in, because the aliens are only ever going to be on the view screen. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, but I, I will point out that uh, it does involve an actor uh, who is uh, a, also in uh, something a friend of the show has, uh, you know, uh, directed recently. So that's kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, probably the one you expect because it's the only actor anyone talks about. But. <laughs> so, yeah. So uh, next time, uh, Deja Q. Next time on Watchers of Tomorrow. Full frontal censored nudity. You have been listening to Watchers of Tomorrow, a podcast on science fiction media. Find and follow Watchers of Tomorrow on Podbean, YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Pocket Cast, Spreader, Digital Podcasts, and perhaps many more to come. If you enjoy our podcast, make sure to subscribe for more. And where possible, make sure to rate your experience or leave us a review. You may find Gepwin on youtube.com slash Gepwin and Twitter at Gepwin. You may find me, Dr. Isix, on youtube.com slash Dr. Isix and Twitter at IsixLP. Music is Waveform and Mori's Principle, both by DRKRN. You can also check out the Watchers of Tomorrow Discord channel. Make sure to share the experience with your friends, family, enemies, and alien overlords. If you feel you are suffering from transporter syndrome, please be aware that the next time you step off the transporter, that you, that is now, no longer exists. <laughs> <laughs>